And God says to us the most encouraging words possible. My child, nothing is out of my hands. All things are in my hands. You need favor from other people. If it fits your ultimate good, then worry not. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men came and were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard. So this word prudence and this word discretion, these these words, really they come from the root of to taste. So Daniel literally here is tasting well. And that's a good word picture to sort of put in your mind. Because, you know, your sense of taste is something that can be refined and trained. And so Daniel here is the picture of a man who can taste righteousness and taste evil and just sort of discern. That was what the whole first chapter was really showing us, was that Daniel is a man, even at 13 or 14 years old, he's a, he's a man that has wisdom and discernment. And we see this consistent picture of Daniel throughout. Is he's, he is one who displays wisdom and discernment. And so with prudence, he asked the captain of the guard this question. Verse 14, Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? What's the big deal? Why, why is the king's hair on fire? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. So apparently Daniel and his friends didn't even know about this fateful dream and this fateful decree by Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 16, And Daniel went in and requested that the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Now, we're going to camp on that verse for a little bit. Because in case you missed it, that verse was the most stunning verse in the book so far. Daniel went before the king. I take it to mean he went, he himself went before the king and requested that the king would grant him a time, which is precisely what he didn't just do to the Chaldeans. Remember? The Chaldeans were wanting time. Give us some time, king. No. You're stalling. Tell me right now or you'll die today. Daniel goes before here, 16, maybe 17 years old, goes before the king and asks for the very thing that the Chaldean magicians asked for that the king denied. And Daniel is granted it. Now you're saying, okay, let's think about that. That is absolutely stunning. Nebuchadnezzar desired to give to Daniel the very thing that he denied his own people when they asked him for time. The God of the universe, remember this is the point of the book. God is sovereign over the nations and his people will suffer a great deal at the hands of the nations, but God will preserve them. And God, the God of the nations shows His sovereignty over the very heart of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what we'll look at for just a few minutes, is the sovereignty of God over the hearts of man, while at the same time, God never violates the will of any man. This is an absolutely stunning truth that comes to us from the Scriptures. I would say one of the most stunning truths that the Scriptures have for us. And that is to say to us that in a mysterious way, God is sovereign over the hearts and the wills and the thoughts of people, even people who don't know Him or acknowledge Him. And He is sovereign over their hearts and wills and He does it in such a way that He never violates their will. That in His sovereignty, He causes them to act in ways that please Him 
while at the same time they act fully of their own accord. Now, if that sounds like something that I'm just saying because I want you to believe that, let's look to the Scriptures and see if the Scriptures actually say that. And what we'll find is a plethora of scriptural evidence that teaches us the very thing that I just articulated to you. Just some of the places, there are many more, but just some of the places, I want to begin from Psalm, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. Proverbs 21 and verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. That's pretty plain. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Now, it's interesting to me that the proverb writer chose the king as his illustration. He could have said the shepherd's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it where he will. Or the carpenter's heart or the mother's heart or whatever. But he chose the king. Why would he choose the king? This is a day of authoritarian, author, 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 what's the word? There you go. Dictators, those people, in which there were no limits to power. And so if there were a man who had no limit to his power, it was the king. What the king said was law. And so the proverb writer says, even the king, the one who speaks and it's done, even his will Even his desires, his thoughts are a stream in the Lord's hand. Now, we're familiar with the story of the Hebrew children, their slavery in Egypt. And God calls Moses and he's going to send Moses to be their rescuer, to be their deliverer. And you remember how he tells Moses that that when you leave Egypt, you're not going to leave empty handed, but you are going to indeed plunder the Egyptians and they're going to give you all their gold and silver and their jewelry, jewelry and everything. It's interesting to me how God puts that. Look at Exodus chapter 3. And this is God speaking to Moses here. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Wait a minute. I will give this people favor. In the sight of the Egyptians. God didn't just say, I'll make everything work out well for you. God didn't just say, I'll give you nice weather when you're traveling past the Red Sea. He didn't just say, I'll feed you with manna when you disobey me and have to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. He said, in the hearts of the Egyptians, I will give you favor with them. Can you grasp a little bit of the weight of that? For God to say, I, no, I'm not just going to make people show you favor against their will. I'm not just going to force people to be nice to you. For I am sovereign over the heart. And I will give you favor in their heart. And when you, do, when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of his neighbor and, and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Now, usually plunder means that you've won the victory. And against their will, against the will of your enemy, you take their wealth. But that's not what plunder means here. What plunder means here is that they give it willingly. The people of Israel, this is skipping ahead to chapter 12 when all this comes about. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold, jewelry and for clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. I don't see in any of those passages the Egyptians doing what they didn't want to do. There's nothing about how the Egyptians were tied up while the Israelites took their gold and their jewelry. It doesn't say anything about how God caused the 11th plague to come about and another big realm of darkness fell over and they couldn't see the Egyptians or the Israelites taking their jewelry. It says that they asked them and they gave it to them, meaning that that's what they wanted to do. That God in His sovereignty caused the Egyptians in their heart 
to willingly want to give the jewelry to the Israelites. Which, by the way, the point of all that was so that they would have raw materials for the tabernacle. Let's keep going. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. This is fast forwarding about 70 years. Daniel's now dead. The king Cyrus of Persia has declared that the, all the Israelites may go back home to Jerusalem. But now there's this deal of the, the temple. The temple was destroyed and they have no means to rebuild the temple. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. And the proclamation is, I will, re- will rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of the Israelites. The king of the known world has stirred up within his heart a desire to show favor to God's people. Now, if you flip over onto the next page, Isaiah 45 and verse 4 through 5. Here, this is several hundred years prior. God is speaking about the same King Cyrus through his prophet Isaiah. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I equip you, though you do not know me. Cyrus doesn't know the Lord. Cyrus is not a child of God. Cyrus has not submitted his will to the Lord. Yet the Lord has sovereignty over Cyrus' heart in such a way that he causes Cyrus in his heart to desire to do good for God's people by funding and building the temple for them. Ezra 6 and verse 22, And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. This is This is stunning. That God does not just say, I will work all things out for your eternal good, meaning all the happenings and events and circumstances. That would be stunning enough. But God actually says to us in His Word, I will show you favor by causing those who need to show you favor to do so willingly. Not against their will, not under compulsion. God doesn't rob from the rich and give to the poor in that sense. He puts it in the, into the heart of those, even those who don't know Him or acknowledge Him. He puts it into their heart to take compassion upon His people and to do good for His people. In His sovereignty, God sometimes restrains people. Remember the story in Genesis chapter 20? This happens a few times. There's Abraham, there's Sarah, his wife. They go down to Egypt and Abraham has this good-looking wife, Sarah, and he knows that they, they're, it's likely they're going to take, a, take her for their harem. And if Abraham is her husband, they're going to kill him to do it. And so they come up with this scheme. Abraham says, tell him I'm your brother. Tell him you're my sister, right? So they won't kill me. And that happens. And she's taken into the harem of King Abimelech. But you remember what happens? Abimelech does not violate her. For some reason, it's not in the heart of Abimelech to violate her. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 6, this is a conversation here between Abimelech and God. God said to Abimelech in a dream, yes, I know that you have done this, meaning you've refrained from violating Sarah. You've done this in the integrity of your heart, meaning you didn't keep Sarah pure because you somehow didn't have the opportunity or you didn't keep Sarah pure just because you were refrained from doing it or the circumstances didn't allow it. You kept her pure because in the heart of your integrity, that's what you wanted to do. You have done this in the integrity of your heart and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. It was I who did that, says God. In His sovereignty, sometimes He makes people stubborn. Deuteronomy 2 and verse 30, But Sihon, the king of Heshbon, would not let him let us pass. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might give him into your hand. Or Joshua 11 and verse 20, For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order, in order that they should be devoted to destruction. Now, God is showing this amazing sovereignty to cause favor in the hearts of people towards Israel. His children. So obviously we see the connection. 
Daniel has been shown great favor by Nebuchadnezzar. And it wasn't the first time. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 9? And the Lord gave favor to Daniel with the chief of the eunuchs. So Daniel has been shown this favor, not just from God, but from people, from the king, from Nebuchadnezzar. I wasn't reading lines into any of that, was I? I wasn't seeing something that wasn't there. Was that plain to all of us? That God plainly says, I'm sovereign over the heart. And I will stir the heart of people when it when it fits my purpose. I will stir the heart of people, even people that don't know me. I will stir their heart to do good to you. Now, we have a problem with that, don't we? And the problem is nobody wants to think of themselves as a robot or a puppet. We don't want to think of ourselves just... There's this God that's got puppet strings on us and, and when we do good things, it's because He's moving the strings and all. We don't want to think like that. The Bible never, never gives us opportunity to think that when God stirs the heart to do things which, such as we just read, that it's against our will or that we're robots or this isn't us doing it. In fact, the Bible always affirms for us that it is done of our own desire, of our own accord. Look with me at one particular scripture here. There's others, but we could look at one particular scripture. This is an amazing passage of scripture. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now I'm going to piece together two verses that are a few sentences apart. Verse 8, and I'm sorry, verse 6, and I'm going, to, I'm going to put them together with verses 16 and 17. The context of 2 Corinthians 8 is the context of this offering for the Jerusalem church. There's this famine going on, and the Jerusalem church, the, the people are hungry. And so the Gentile churches are co- taking up this collection to give to the Jerusalem church to alleviate their famine. And so they're in this big process. It's this long process of going around, collecting money from all the different churches and getting it because they didn't have PayPal. They couldn't just wire the money over. They had to go collect all this money and collect it up and take it to the Jerusalem church. So they're in the process, all the the logistics of getting that done. Now, in the context of all that, look at this. This is a stunning verse in which the Bible is going to say to us, something happened and three people were responsible for it. Three people had a hand in it. Paul, Titus, and God. Look at this. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. So in other words, Paul says, me and my brothers and sisters here, we urge Titus. Titus, come on, you you started this this work of grace. Now, don't drop it. Keep going with it. See it through. So we urged him. We encouraged Titus to continue with this act of grace. But thanks to God, thanks be to God, who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. So Paul says, we urged him. We encouraged him. Titus, see the thing through. But it was God who actually worked in his heart and put that desire into his heart. Yet, for he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. Wow. So Titus is going to see this thing through. Why is he going to see it through? Well, for one, Paul and his friends urged him. For number two, God put it in his heart. God stirred in his heart to give favor to those people that were in need of this offering. But clearly, Titus did it of his own accord. God never violates the will of man. We do what we want to do. We do what we desire to do. But God in His sovereignty will stir into the hearts of people to show favor to His people or sometimes disfavor to His people when it meets God's ultimate purpose, which is Romans 8.28, the ultimate purpose of our good. Now, why do we take so much time to go through that? Well, first of all, the passage really demands it. Because twice now, Daniel has been the recipient of favor from people who don't even acknowledge God. But here's the real reason that we really need to kind of camp on this. I'm guessing that your life is like mine, that over and over in your life, you are in situations in which you really need something from somebody else. 
You really need this boss or this coworker or this supervisor to do this or give you that letter or send that reference or fill out that form. Am I right? Am I also right that in our fallen minds, we tend to think of the sovereignty of God as stopping when it comes to the will of other people? That somehow God is sovereign over all things except that. And so when we come up to face to face with those situations in our life in which we have this desperate need, but we need somebody to do something, then for us, don't, don't you kind of feel like, oh, well, sort of out of everybody's hands now until that person decides to do this, or maybe he won't decide to do this. And God says to us the most encouraging words possible. My child, nothing. Nothing is out of my hands. All things are in my hands. You need favor from other people. If it fits your ultimate good, then worry not. On the other hand, maybe disfavor from other people fits God's ultimate good. That too is in His hands. This is one of the most encouraging truths in Scripture. That God is not a God that just comes and ties up people that He wants to use and sort of ties your hands behind your back and make you do what you don't really want to do. But He's sovereign over the heart. The King's heart is like a stream in the Lord's hands. And He moves it where He will. I will give you favor in their eyes. The Lord gave to Daniel favor with the chief eunuch. The Lord gave to Daniel favor with Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel asks of Nebuchadnezzar the same thing that just got the others killed. So those situations in your life that you will face every single... You you know all those... You face them every single day. Nothing is beyond the sovereignty of God. Nothing is beyond His capability to bring favor upon your life when it suits His purpose, to bring trials upon your life when it suits His purpose, to bring suffering or difficulty upon your life when it suits His purpose. What what an awesome God in whose hands are all things. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Truth That Transforms with pastor and Bible teacher Jason Wilkerson. Truth That Transforms is the daily teaching broadcast of Disciples Fellowship Church. We invite you to visit our website where you will find more resources to help in your journey of discipleship. You can find us at www.disciplesfellowshipnc.com or connect with our Facebook page at Facebook slash Disciples Fellowship NC. Truth That Transforms exists to glorify Jesus Christ through the teaching of His sanctifying and disciple-making Word.